If you take the infected herd and you, unfortunately, you remove them all, you can put new animals in the pastures in one to two years. The organism does not replicate in the environment, so you've got a clean pasture two years from now. That's different than, say, anthrax. In the old days, when the, the farmer's field had anthrax, you put sheep there, you got anthrax again. So this is not what I call an environmental organism. I consider it's a host-associated pathogen where the vast majority of the bacteria are causing disease. Transiently, it spills out of the sick animals into the environment. So, what does it do to the cows where it is found? And how many cows, how many cattle are affected? It, there's also a map sheep, and I'm not going to talk about the sheep pathogen because there's just less data, there's less information today. So, this is what Mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis does. It causes a disease that was named for a German scientist, so that's pronounced Yone's disease, not John's disease. Yone's disease is a form of inflammatory bowel disease that has some similarities to Crohn's, but is not identical to Crohn's. So yes, there's some chronic IBD, but no, you wouldn't look at one slice and the other slice and say this is exactly superimposable. It is usually manifest in a relatively non-specific but pragmatic or economically important way. The cow is making less milk. And if you're feeding a cow so that it's productive, so that you can sell the milk, and your cow doesn't make milk, then that's obviously something that's important to the farmer. This cow, as you can see, you can count the ribs. That's a sign of weight loss. And the cow can have profuse diarrhea if it is left to go to the advanced stages. When I say it causes inflammatory bowel disease, I think it's very important to understand the difference between cause and association. This is known to be caused by formal experimental studies. So that means you take 10 cows and you give five of them this organism and you give five of them water. You will prove that this organism causes disease to happen. We then tend to not be able to do that as well in humans where you can just take 10 people in this room and say, okay, you guys in this side of the room, we're going to give you mycobacterium paratuberculosis. And you guys in this room, we're going to give you the regular water. But I'm just showing that we know it is the cause of disease in cows. That's a fact. Okay? So then you'd say, okay, well, is that a small or a big problem? For Crohn's disease, it's irrelevant, right? You've got Crohn's disease, you want to know why you have Crohn's disease. But nonetheless, if you've got a livestock disease, you might want to know how many cattle are affected. Here's a report published by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, April of 2008. So it's relatively recent data. And what they did is they said, if a livestock operation, so that's a farm, has a problem with mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis, rather than testing every single cow, we will test the soil. So I said most of the bugs are in the cows, but they will transiently spill into the environment. So if you can culture it out of the poo that's in the ground, you know that one of the cows had it. You don't necessarily have to know which one, because in livestock husbandry, unlike medicine where we treat you as an individual, in farms you, you treat herds. You have to try to understand how to manage a herd. So what they said is let's find out how many of these operations have this organism on the farm. And they found that if you're a small farm with less than 100 cattle, it's about 63%. If you're a medium with 100 to 499 head, it's about 75%. If you're a large, that means you have 500 or more head, you're at about 95%. So in fact, there's very few large cattle operations in the U.S. that are spared. This is actually a big problem for the farmers. And what they actually wrote is, although environmental sampling is an ineffective method of detecting organisms, it will not, it, sorry, it's effective, it will not detect all infected operations, thus the reported percentages will be less than the true prevalence. So using what they think is an underestimate, they say it's 68% of dairy operations in the U.S. are affected. So there's a big problem on the farm. Does that mean it causes Crohn's disease? No. That's a problem for the USDA to resolve, and I think in Canada that's a problem for Agriculture Canada and others to resolve. But I think it shouldn't be overlooked. I think somebody's got to look into that. That's not what I do, but I'm just saying it's important. So, how is this organism spread where it is known to cause disease? The term we use in epidemiology is fecal oral. This is why your mother taught you to wash your hands after you go to the washroom. 
like all the other intestinal pathogens, in this case, it goes from the feces of the cow into the barn and gets picked up in the mouth of the calf, and then that calf gets diseased. When an animal has severe disease and develops diarrhea, there are a lot of bacteria. Now you have to sort of think of this a little bit and try to, I don't know, are there any people here who have farmed with cattle? Okay, so you can tell me exactly how many kilograms or liters are put out per day. But if you're putting out 100 liters a day and the bacteria is at something like 10 to the 8th or 10 to the 9th bacteria uh, per liter, you're getting up to sort of like a trillion bacteria that are being put out in a single day from an infected cow. So now we're getting into the, the range of the U.S. bailout plan, a trillion dollars. <laughs> Those bacteria, even if they don't replicate in the environment, there's still going to be a trillion tomorrow and maybe half a trillion next week. If they get picked up by calves, then you've got a problem, and then the calves will go on to develop disease. Okay, so that's what we know about this in terms of its spread on the farm. What about the unknowns? Well, there's a very important unknowns here, okay? If MAP is on the farms, we could imagine that human exposure could happen the way, for instance, we have E. coli 0157 on the farms. It also lives in the gut of a cattle. So maybe through water, maybe through milk, maybe through meat. It could happen, right? It's possible. But the real question is, does it? Is this being actually documented? Has somebody shown that this exposure goes to people? If it happens, what is the dose that is needed to infect a human? Hard study to do. Remember I was saying I was going to take the left half and give you math and maybe the right half and not give? Well, no, actually, now you have to do a slightly more refined study and say, and then in the group that gets it, I'm going to give 10 to the 2 to table 1 and 10 to the 4 to table 2. We don't know that. We have no good understanding of how many bacteria are needed to pose a threat to people. So, would you be concerned to know there might be 10 bacteria in a liter of milk if I had as a fact that you need a million bacteria to cause disease? Probably you wouldn't be, but we don't know if it's a million, we don't know if it's 10, so there's a lot of guesswork, and risk management people would want to know that type of information. So I think this, the human risk is known unknown number one. We know it causes disease in cows, how it could cause disease in humans is a real perplexing research question. So, another approach is to say, okay, well, let's just leave the farm for now. Let's go to the hospital. Let's take people who have real human diseases and work backwards and say, can we find evidence that people with Crohn's disease have the organism? Okay? So the way these studies are done is you take people with Crohn's disease and you take people with other conditions like colitis, diverticulitis, colon cancer, and you look for whether that organism is present in the tissue. Now some methods are DNA methods, you've heard of PCR, this is the method that was used to link the blood on O.J. Simpson's sidewalk with the blood on the glove that didn't fit his hand. This is kind of like CSI of mycobacteria, okay? It's not going to get the same readership or viewership as CSI in Miami. And then you can look in a microscope, and classically in microbiology, we do cultures. We grow organisms in the lab. So what has been shown, if you start with people with Crohn's disease and you look backwards for presence of this organism, these types of studies have, there's been many of them, and some find an association, and some find maybe not, and maybe it's not statistically significant. So the way epidemiologists handle it, they do what's called a meta-analysis, where you pool all the studies together, you add up all the people where you found it and all the people you didn't. And last year, two meta-analyses both said there is an association. Crohn's tissue has more mycobacterium per tuberculosis. They both said, we don't know if it's the cause, but there is an association across two meta-analyses. Now, at the same time as these PCR methods, our lab took a, a very retro approach. We said, well, what about using a microscope? <laughs> How would a condition be positive by this newfangled PCR method, but since Pearl Crohn's article in 1932, it has never been seen under a microscope? I sort of thought that was a bit of a dilemma. <laughs> because maybe it's the case, or maybe not. 
Well, we had done some experimental infections where we put mycobacteria 